make sure everybody's got a full belly and let's wake you up here a little bit. <laughs> I don't know where they did that last one, but I'm sure it was invented in a fire station somewhere. I don't know how they got that leg in there. Alright, so here's the state of Arizona. Um, the, we call the valley, which is the Phoenix metro area. We're a suburb of, of Phoenix, but we're the third largest city in, in Arizona. We have about 500,000 um, residents. This is an aerial view of our downtown. And yes, that is snow up on the mountains in the background. Very, very common during the winter for those mountains to have snow on them, but very, very rare to have snow down in the valley here. Anybody know what we call these? These dust storms? We call them haboobs. Haboobs is what we call them. And we get them probably half a dozen times a year. And it's caused by, by thunderstorms and, and the downdrafts, blows the dust like that. We are the Mesa Fire and Medical Department. We just decided last year to change our name to better suit the role that we have in the community. We do about 3% fires and we do about 85% medical, so we changed our name to embrace that fact. We are a full service fi uh, fire based EMS system, so when someone calls 911 in our, in our country, 911 is the emergency number, they usually will get a fire engine first. We have two paramedics and two EMTs on every vehicle, and we have over 40 vehicles that respond out of 20 fire stations. Um, we also have <clears throat> fire prevention, um, fire and life safety education, so those are the folks that help us do the bystander CPR training for our community. Um, fire prevention enforces all the fire codes and all that kind of stuff. That's all part of the fire department. In Arizona, there's over almost 250 fire departments, and 50 of those, or thir I'm sorry, 30 of those are private. So most of them are municipal fire departments, and most of them do EMS. Um, the career verse and mostly career are the people get paid on the department to be there. But the majority of fire departments in the United States are still volunteer. So you only get paid when you play kind of thing. So when you get a call out, then you would get paid. Um, otherwise, you don't get paid to be on the fire service. So I'm fortunate. I'm one of the few that we get to, we are full-time paid employees of the fire department. This is a picture that was taken in the 1940s. So we have a long history of doing fires and fire suppression. This truck here is a 1941 Seagraves. It's actually still in service. It's used as our parade truck. We use it in ceremonies and that kind of thing for weddings and all those kinds of things. It's a beautiful truck. Um, it's red. Our fire trucks are no longer red. Our fire trucks have kind of evolved. This is one of the newest engines that we have. It's over $500,000 each. And here's one of our ladder trucks, one of our new ladder trucks. This is about 1.2 million US dollars for that vehicle. It's an 85 foot aerial ladder with, with twin guns on the top. So traditionally, fire departments, this is what we would go do. Okay, but since the 1970s in the United States, we've kind of branched into other things. 
So these are pretty typical car accidents, doing the mechanical extrication out of a vehicle. We also do airport rescue firefighting. We have two airports in the city of Mesa. <clears throat> we do technical rescue. So this is someone out on a trail who was hiking that collapsed. And it takes a bunch of people to get that person out. You can see a you know, laser. They have the Stokes basket with a big wheel. And they just walk them out. They wheel them out, put them in the Stokes basket, and wheel them out. But it takes a lot of manpower to do that. Anybody see what's going on here? The problem? There's a tree trimmer that was cutting this skirt, and this skirt weighs upwards of a thousand pounds. And when they cut him the wrong way, it collapses on him and, and caves in on him. Because he has a chain around the tree, so it traps him there. So that's what's going on here. And this is the bucket trying to get him out. This is a body recovery, not a, not a rescue, unfortunately. Anybody see, anybody see a problem here? Yeah. This is kind of the high profile stuff that we do, so they would have to go up and do a high angle rescue. This was a mentally disturbed person who thought it would be a good idea to climb up on the big power lines. Never a good idea. And then we do some fun stuff like rescue horses out of canals. We have open, open canals that bring us our irrigation water to, you can see these are orange groves up on top here. We have quite a bit of orange groves, which doesn't make sense in a desert, but we do. Looks like he's about to kiss them there, I'm not sure. But this was a happy ending, we got the horse out, so. But that's pretty typical. We have a lot of people that drive into the canals. We have people that fall into the canals and drown, unfortunately. But this is what we mostly do. We go into people's houses and we render medical care. Okay? And we do that with a four-person crew that arrives on a fire engine. The Mesa Fire Medical Department last year, we ran over 51,000 medical calls. We had about 80,000 total calls to include service calls, fire calls, all that kind of stuff. Um, we transported 28,000, so about a little more than half of the patients that we see, we transport to, to area emergency rooms. We had 526 dead prior to arrival, so when we got there, we, we just pronounced them. They were too far gone to start efforts and 92 dead after arrival. So we have a pretty aggressive field termination program. If they meet the protocols, we can just call them in the field and we don't have to transport them. Here's kind of the breakdown of the calls that we go on and you can see most of the calls we go on are trauma related. And that's everything from a stub toe up to a multi-systems trauma where we're doing a, a field resuscitation. We have about 424 cardiac arrests so a little over one per day in our system. This is pretty typical of what we go on. In Mesa itself, just in the Eastern Valley, we have four hospitals. Three of those are cardiac arrest centers. Uh, three of them are stroke centers. There's specific hospitals for those disease processes that we can take them to. We can bypass other hospitals to take them there. So if we had a, a cardiac arrest patient that we had in Ross, we would bypass the nearest hospital to take them to a cardiac receiving center. We have one children's hospital, um, we, but we have transported over the last year to 16 area hospitals. So we transport as far uh, away as Phoenix um, to the VA hospital. We do quite a bit there. We have six trauma centers. They are pretty much all of them are centrally located in the Phoenix area. Very, it's uh, very centrally located, so we have to take about a 20 minute ride from where we are to take them to a trauma center. So, in the United States, and specifically Arizona, an EMT is the base level. We don't have a first responder, really. We, we do, but we don't use it on our fire service. So, EMTs, we have two of those on each vehicle. And it's a basic level of training. You can't get hired on a fire department in the state of Arizona without being an EMT. 130 hours is the minimum. Usually most of the programs run closer to 200 hours. And this is usually given at a community college level for one semester. 
They recertify every two years and they have to prove that they worked as an EMT to be able to recertify. So you can't just get the certification and never work as an EMT. You have to show that you're working as an EMT. And then they have to receive 24 hours of continuing education to maintain that certification. Okay. And that includes five hours of pediatric emergency care, CPR, that good stuff. The next level is the paramedic level. And there's two of these on every vehicle that we have in Mesa. And pretty much in the Metro Phoenix area, we all run the same. The initial training is at least 1,000 hours. Um, most of the, the program that I went through was about 1,600 hours, so it varies depending on the program that you go to, but that's the minimum that the state requires. Um, and we recertify every two years, and we have to get a minimum of 48 hours. We used to have to get, they just changed it this last year, we used to have to get 60, 60 hours. We do have a national registry certification, and it's supposed to be across the United States, so a paramedic could go from one state to one state to the next state to the next state to remain certified. That system hasn't worked out. It doesn't work that way. We're not reciprocal in that fashion. Um, and that requires 72 hours per two years if you're going to maintain the National Registry Standard. But not a lot of people do, I don't. Because it's not, it doesn't transfer from state to state to state, so there's no real benefit to that. Some of the medical skills that we do, we do MICR. Was anybody in my last talk over in the EMS track? We talked about MICR, which is the hands-only CPR that we do with the pit crew method, and real-time CPR feedback on our uh, EKG monitors. We do RSI, innovation, we use King Airways as our, our superglottic airway, cricothyrotomy, um, needle thoracostomies. We'll talk about a couple of the other things here. We do uh, 12 lead EKG, and we're in a very good position. When we do our 12 lead EKGs, the hospitals trust what we're telling them. So we can actually activate the cath lab just by calling a STEMI alert. And we, don't have to, we're, we don't transmit our 12 lead EKGs, which is very nice and very rare. So they trust us when we do that. It's tough to do that at 1 o'clock in the morning. You really want to make sure that you have a STEMI before you call that. So how do you maintain all this training? We do it on duty. So we have an 18-day training cycle, and I'll show you a calendar here in a second. Um, but we train four crews at a time. So let me show you the next. This is our training schedule. So the gray areas here are the training days. So basically, it's every Wednesday and Thursday of every month. And it, this is every month of the whole year we do this kind of training. So every day, four <coughs> crews come in on duty, and our system is able to absorb that. Um, deficiency for four hours. So that's four hours of training on each of these days for four crews. So we have 16 people that come through. It's mostly um, hands-on training that we do. Right now, this schedule here is actually our ACLS recertification, and we actually put our BLS providers through that training as well. They're not required to, to know all the stuff, but it, we feel that it makes them better EMTs to know what the paramedic's job is. So they get all that training as well. So they, they easily get their 24 hours of training because they get the same amount as the paramedics. But we feel that it's important that the crews that are in the field, the ones that are going to touch the patients, actually train together. It's, they can identify the words that they use and cues that they use and they can work off of each other much easier that way. Well, we, were, we used to do an overtime system for uh, CE which was we bring you in off duty, but we'd have to pay overtime. Through budget cuts, um, I don't know if you guys have felt those in the last few years, but the United States certainly has. We went through the Great Recession, um, and we had to cut our budget significantly, and training was one of the big things that we had to deal with. So that's why we went through the schedule. The shift schedules in Arizona, most fire-based EMS systems work a 24-hour shift. And most of the private ambulance services also will work the 24-hour shift. We love the 24-hour shift. It's great. There's been a lot of talk of trying to take away the 24-hour shift. Thank you. Um, but basically, it's a, either a 20, 24 on 48 day off. That's the Phoenix fire schedule. They have a 4896. So you're working two 24-hour days, and then you get four days off. 
And then the shift that we work in the Mesa Fire and Medical Department is this, we call it the 3-4 schedule. 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, 24 on, 4 off. Okay, real nice. And then we run three shifts, A, B, and C shift. <coughs> medical direction, we are very fortunate. The Valley has come together and all the medical directors get together and we, they make our um, offline protocols. So we can do most everything that we need to do for a patient offline. We don't have to consult a doctor. Um, they're written protocols. We all have to know them. There's 33 adult algorithms and 19 child algorithms that we have to kind of commit to memory. We can check them. We have them on our, we have uh, electronic patient care reporting that we can check on them. Um, but we need to pretty much know those inside and out. We can always... <coughs> Um, call a physician if we need to. We have a base hospital, Desert Samaritan Medical Center. We can call them at any time. If something is outside the parameters of the offline protocol, we can call. Or if we just, I don't know why I got doc, I can't fit them in any algorithm. But most of the time, we never have to call for a doctor. So this is a standard response. You either get an engine or a ladder company with four people, two paramedics, two EMTs, and then we have a private ambulance company that is uh, uh, just a private company that does that, called Southwest Ambulance, and they have one EMT and one paramedic on board. So on the lower acuity patients, we can transfer them directly to the ambulance and they can take care of them. On the higher acuity patients, we would remain patient care and we'd follow in with the, with the patient in the ambulance and maintain control. We were realizing that every single patient, every single person that calls 911 doesn't need a four-person emergency response. So we came up with a TRV program, stands for Transitional Response Vehicle, and we have four of these. There's one with a mid-level provider and a paramedic captain on board, so it's a nurse practitioner on one of our rides. They can go out and do all the nurse practitioner stuff, sutures, they can do blood cultures, they can do all sorts of different blood tests, they can give vaccinations, all the things that we can't do. They also can follow up on the higher acuity patients that we take to the hospital, such as CHF patients, COPD patients that are high readmit patients, so they can go out on that. We have a behavioral provider, so we have a master's level social worker that goes out with a paramedic captain and an EMT, and they take care of about 15% of our calls are behavioral in nature, so behavioral in nature. So they're able to go out and, and take those because paramedics and firefighters don't have that kind of training. We do a lot of immunizations. We did over 10,000 immunizations last year, and this was for people that don't have health insurance. So we do a lot of kids, and this poor kid's getting getting a shot in both arms. Our trend is trying to get away from innovating patients that we don't need to. Um, we would RSI a lot of people because that was the only way that we could maintain their airway. But now we have some different technologies that we can use, CPAP and BiPAP, or bi-level ventilation. We're starting, we've been doing CPAP for about a year and a half, and we just started rolling out the bi-level ventilation. There's someone putting the mask on, getting, getting some CPAP going there. If you haven't been doing CPAP, it's really the golden bullet for CHF. There's many, many, many studies that show that that's really the way that we should be going. And then the bi-level ventilation is for most of the patients that we're seeing that we're putting on CPAP have passed the point where they call us too late. They wait and wait and wait and wait. And then now they're past the point where CPAP can help them. So now we've introduced bi-level ventilation, which actually gives them a little ventilation help because they're so tired. And then it also keeps that CPAP on there. This is the ventilator that we use down here. It's also a mechanical ventilator, the CPAP BiPAP. It's a full um, ventilator. This is an actual case from bi-level. So had a patient in tripod position, audibly wet lungs, SATs in the 70s. SATs came up to the 80s and would non rebreathe their mask. And then once we put the bi-level on, SATs now at 100, doing much better. So that's the kind of things that we're looking for. The last thing I'll talk about real quick is our Arizona EPIC project. It is implementing the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. 
in Arizona as a whole in tracking the results. So this is a big project that I've been, I work for the University of Arizona also on a part-time basis as an educator for this program. Any questions? You guys are quiet, sleepy after lunch. Yes? About your working schedule? Yes. Well, Bill, <clears throat> there are some safeguards as far as like working overtime and that kind of stuff. So they can, our folks working on the 3-4 schedule can only work 72 hours in a row. And then they have to have at least 12 hours off, and then they can come back to work. So they can't just continually work and work and work and work and work. Most of the time, um, the units aren't, they get some rest. You know, most of our units are planned that way. Some of them really get killed, um, and they're up all night and all day. Um, that's, a, that's one of the reasons why we've looked at different kind of schedules, like the 10-14 schedule, so a 10-hour, 14-hour schedule. But the, the labor group will not give up that 24-hour schedule because the guys like it so much. <laughs> Any other questions? If you have any questions or you want the presentation at all, please let me know and I can give it to you. I have it on flash drive. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, uh, how long does it take to train a paramedic in proficient at putting on the like that? Okay. How much training hours? We did, we probably did about 20 hours worth of training per paramedic. She's waving her time's up on that. So it took us about 20 minutes, 20 hours. We had trainers that we trained. Now we had never done seen that before. Um, and it took us 24 hours to train the trainers and then the trainers did training. And that wasn't all at one time. We did a little bit here, a little bit there. So, and we continue to do that type of training. We just got done with that. Um, we deliver that in different models, not just in that four hour block of training. We also send crews out, trainers out to the stations where they can do that. But it does take, a little bit of while. We have, we have to do the mechanical ventilator part, so they have to understand that as well as CPAP. So that was, that's why more training. So CPAP itself I don't think would take that long if it's something that you want to institute. It's pretty simple. What was the feedback from the, from the crews? Was it easy to learn? I mean, perhaps we can limit it to the CPAP and CPAP. Right. The, the ventilator that we're using is a full critical care ventilator, and the, the biggest complaint was the setup, knowing which buttons to push, and then what alarms were telling us. That the alarms were going off all the time, so we had to tell them to either turn the, the uh, alarms off or know what those alarms were. So that was the biggest complaint. But as, as far as putting it on and getting it going, it would turn patients around in a minute or two, Instead of waiting until you get them all the way to the hospital, 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then at the hospital, you're waiting another 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So that's someone who's having very difficult time breathing that we can turn around in just a couple of minutes. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, do, you, do you have any system to do clinical audits or uh, checks on their clinical skills? I, I missed the last part. Uh, do you have any system? to review their clinical skills? Yes, we do. Through our electronic patient care uh, system, we can we do QA on just about every different kind of, of um, case there is. We do cardiac arrest, we do strokes, we do any narcotic use, any RSIs, any innovations. Those all get reviewed by the EMS division. Um, and if there's any deficiencies, we call them in, and we can actually have the medical director talk to them, or we can talk to them depending on how bad you know the problem is, um, it, or if it's a if it's a problem that we've corrected, and then they keep doing it, keep doing it, we can bring them in, and, and we can do more things with them. But we do keep a close eye on that. We use our our, our field personnel to do a lot of that. Um, we train them to what we're looking for. Um, and then they review the charts and then they, they actually will talk to the crews and tell them how they did. We do that on every cardiac arrest for sure. So we talk about, hey, you did great compressions, we can see where you did here, you shocked the right thing, 
and your patient survived. From your data, is it? Mm. We maintain a full database, and we have uh, we actually have a, an RN, a registered nurse in our EMS division that does all the QA. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, how do you get volunteers? I mean, you mentioned that you've got sixty percent right. of, of volunteers. So how do you manage to motivate them to keep on volunteering their time, and and you know, what motivates them to join the fire service? That's a great question. There are. Um, I think it's personal reasons. They're personally, they want to serve in their community is the biggest thing and they want to help people. Um, they get opportunities to get some great training, medical, medical training, some basic medical training and the fire training. I think it's just something that is a passion for that person. And, and I mean, they can drop it at any time and they do, but it's, it's something that a fire chief would have to manage and sometimes it's difficult because the fire chief is a lot of times a volunteer as well. So they have to, you know, and so that any time they can just say, I'm not doing this because I'm not going to pay. But most of them do it because they personally feel indebted to their community to do that service. All right, I think I'm out of time. We have a burning question. Maybe speak to you during the break. Sure.